never crossed my mind to be ex- exporting this anywhere at all. And I noticed that I had like 90% of my website traffic was coming from the US. So I just had this aha moment like, oh my God, I need to capture this audience. Like this is such a natural market for me. Welcome to the Startup CPG podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Freitag. Have you seen those how it started, how it's going posts? Today, we basically get to do that as we catch up with one of the brands from Startup CPG's second pitch competition in November of 2020, Subi Soup, which since then has really utilized the Slack community to help make helpful connections. Started by Subasa Nishitani, whose nickname is Subi, Subi Soups are gourmet, plant-based, instant soups made with premium vegetables and state-of-the-art freeze-drying technology. Today, we're joined by Subi and husband Alex Novak to hear about how they bring Japanese miso soups to the U.S., including the decision to pivot from the Japan market to the U.S. market. Listen in as Subi and Alex share about creating the Subi soup product we see today, learning how to export to the U.S. and setting up the myriad of logistics involved, their other entrepreneurial adventures, including sake and property management, a recent rebrand, and more. Hi, Subi and Alex. How are you today? Hi, Jesse. Hey, Jesse. How are you? Good. So glad to have you on the show. I've become a fan of the Subi products through the samples that you've sent and actually just shared some with a friend yesterday that was super excited. So it's so fun to get to have you both on the show and talk about the story. So I'd love if you could start us off by each introducing yourselves. And then if one of you could just describe the Subi products, that would be great. Sure. Thank you so much for having us, first of all. It's such an honor to be on your podcast, Jesse. Awesome. I'm so glad you're here. So my name is Subi. I'm the CEO and founder of Subi Soup. Today I have my co-founder, Alex, joining us. He is also my wonderful husband. Hey, it's Alex. How are you guys? Awesome. Great. And can you tell us a little bit about the main description of the product and then each of maybe the different you know, flavor options that you have? Sure. So Subi Soup is an instant miso soup that's made with premium ingredients from Japan. And our focus was to use gourmet artisanal produce that normally isn't found in instant soups and making it into a super compact and travel friendly form that's really quick and easy to eat. And what makes us unique is that Tsubi Soup is a compressed and freeze dried cube. So it's about the size of an AirPods case and it weighs about 10 grams, which is about equivalent to two credit cards. And the cube contains a soup broth plus all the veggies and toppings that you would need in a single serving. And all you need is hot water. So the moment the hot water is poured over the cube, it kind of like blossoms into this hearty soup with really big chunky vegetables and toppings that have super fresh and chewable textures like a home cooked soup. And as a brand, we're 100% plant based and our ingredients are clean and fully traceable. That's gluten free and we don't add any MSG. And most importantly, it tastes delicious. Yeah, what a beautiful description. And the packaging is is gorgeous. And then, like you said, it's amazing that this little compressed cube, I love the that you use the word blossom because it really does. You add the hot water and it just it's almost like when you have like one of those blossoming teas or something, it just like turns into this beautiful broth and soup. And then you can also, there's not very many calories in, in the actual, you know, products you can, you can add whatever you want to it. You can just have it. Like I, you know, if I'm sick or if I'm cold or if I need a snack or a pick me up, it's just like perfect and so versatile. And then the ingredients are so clean. I've mentioned to you that our household is gluten-free. So we love that. It's just, it's such a cool product. It just, I love just opening it up and being like, oh, this is, it's, it's exciting every time. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Even our kids, I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old and they just love making the soup because to them, it's almost like a little science experiment mm-hmm. where they pour the hot water and it kind of sprouts out and then they get to mix it up and it's like ready to eat. So if you're a parent out there, I mean, it's, this product is actually such a godsend because your kids will just slip it up. You know, if you want to make it a little meal, you can throw some rice in there. So it's like really convenient from that angle as well. Yeah. Yeah. And we've been traveling for the last three weeks now. We have another week left on this holiday here in the U.S. And, you know, it's been so great to actually have with us. We carry it in our carry-ons. We When we check into hotels, you know, oftentimes we check in late to a hotel. We don't have time to order anything from room service. The kids are hungry. Every hotel just has like a kettle. So you just boil some water, put it in a coffee cup, and it's ready to go. And the kids just love it. 
So it's really been great to travel with, especially since it's so light as well, too. I love when a founder or founders like, you know, you you really solve the problem or get to use your own product all the time. It's it's always so cool that it's like I created this thing because I wanted it and needed it. And now I actually get to use my creation all the time and it helps me in my life. I, it's yeah. so great. <laughs> Uh, especially for, for example, our son, he, our, our one-year-old daughter, she's, she'll eat everything, but our son is a little bit more particular in terms of what he'll eat. But as soon as he gets subi soup with some rice in it, he just gobbles the entire thing up without even hesitation. So for us, it's, it's really been a godsend for, for, for him. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd love if you could tell me the story behind starting soupy soup. I know when I, I was able to catch up with, with soupy probably, I think at some point last year and was just amazed by the story. So I would love if you could share the store founding story with our listeners. Sure. So my background is actually IT, so not food related at all. Uh, my first job was with IBM in Australia, and then I moved to Japan and started working at UBS Investment Bank in Tokyo which is actually where I met my husband, Alex. He was the sales trader and I was the IT chick. <laughs> so there was a bit of a workplace romance going on. And uh, a couple of years later, uh, we relocated to Hong Kong together. And it was just a series of random events that led me to becoming a broker. Uh, I was an interbank broker for Nikkei Index and Stock Derivatives. And I did it for four years and Jesse, it literally broke me. Um, it was a really well-paying job, which is probably why I kind of endured with it for such a long time. But it was definitely the catalyst for change. And the whole time I was pretty miserable and I was plotting my escape for the longest time. And I had a few startup ideas in my back pocket, but the one that really hit the spot for me was soup because I just love soup. And for me, a really good soup is so healing. You know, it just gives me life. And for the longest time, I was just looking for a really yummy and healthy soup that I could bring with me on my business trips. And honestly, I just couldn't find anything close to that. Like everything that tasted half decent would have so much salt in it or trans fats, MSG, lots of dairy, corn syrup, you know, preservatives, colors, like you name it. And, you know, you kind of just suck it up and, uh, and consume it. But then in the end, you'll end up having heartburn or just feeling kind of ill. And then when you narrowed it down to products that were, you know, plant-based or kind of like uh, branded as healthy, I found that the choices were really limited and in general, they would taste pretty terrible. <laughs> and I think that's when I was like t talking to myself thinking, God, why is it so bad? Like, why can't this be better? And I kept thinking, I, you know, I could totally fix this. And I started kind of obsessing with the idea of, you know, starting my own soup brand and thinking, well, if it was my brand, I would make it XYZ features. I would definitely not do this or do that. And that's when I kind of decided I was going to make, um, just create my own dream product and hopefully others would appreciate it. Wow. And so did you actually, did you quit your job? Did you start this on the side? Were you, you working on it at home? What did it kind of look like to get started? Well, just to, to highlight <laughs> how much uh, she, I guess she disliked her job at the time. Every morning, she reminded me of the story the other day. Every morning, I would literally have to pull her legs off the bed and drag her from the bed. Oh, no. <laughs> and lift her up off the bed and try to get her going off to her job. So it very clearly was not her chosen profession. Um, and I'm glad she, she ended up leaving. And just on the soups thing, even back then, I was reminded of, you know, she, she, she used to tell me the story of like, I really want to start this soup brand that, you know, it's like tins that are stackable and you can add whatever flavors you want. It could either be in tins or it could be like in uh, like cylinders that you could just pour in and it's really easy to make. And so she had this dream a long, long time ago, even before, even before we moved to Hong Kong, I remember ha her having that dream. Wow. Yeah. That's so interesting. I mean, honestly, there was no business strategy when I started the idea. One day I probably went on to Google and I searched something in the lines of start soup brand or dehydrate soup into product or something like that. And when I searched processing soup, the first thing that was coming up on my feed were these dehydrators. So I was like, okay, I'll buy a food dehydrator and start with that because I knew I wanted the soup to be like a portable form, so dried and not like a canned soup. And I just went online and purchased a food dehydrator, a commercial dehydrator. And a few days later it arrived and I'd actually forgotten to take measurements of the kitchen and understand how big this machine was because when it arrived, it literally took up half of the kitchen counter space. And Alex came home 
and so and he was like what in the f is this <laughs> i was like go away this is my dream you know <laughs> and yeah i started like experimenting with recipes and uh, i was trying to dehydrate things this is kind of a machine that you use to dehydrate like kale chips and apple chips which is kind of big at the time and uh, i was dehydrating toppings and trying to make broth like bouillons and it just was not working because it would either become this pulverized powder or it would dry up so much to the point where it would take an hour of boiling for it to rehydrate so i was like oh my god this isn't working <laughs> i'm gonna have to outsource this to a professional manufacturing company and so i flew i think in within hong kong i was trying to create the product but it just it didn't really satisfy my needs for like um for uh, like i guess the food supply chain etc so i went to japan and i pitched the idea to a dozen of food manufacturers and i finally found a partner who was uh, happy to make it with me and that's how it all started wow interesting so i'm also you know mentioned that you guys you met at work so alex tell us a little bit about your background as well and then you know what what your role has been as subi soup has grown um so I'm American. I grew up in the U.S. Um, and I also spent a lot of time in Japan and some time in China as well, too. And after university, I went straight into where we met, which was UBS, Investment Bank, in Japan. I do want to be very clear. The, the operational side is completely left to Tsubi. She's in charge of all of that. Where I come in is on the finance side, which is my background. I spent 15 years uh, doing finance and sales. So I'm very comfortable um, looking at the finance side of thing, whether it's how are sales doing, how what are costs looking like, how should we be thinking about the inventory side of things and cash flow, uh, or I try and provide a like an outside sounding board to the day to day stuff because I think any any company or any person can get uh, too locked into their own product and not you know not be able to take five steps back from it. So I try to provide that that outside sounding board for her as well too. Yeah, and often he he'll give me his opinion and I'll do the exact opposite. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think she, asked me far, the right? <laughs> she usually asks me the question. She knows the answer. I'll tell her the right answer and then she'll just do the other one, which ends up being the right answer. So <laughs> there's no wrong or right, really. But yeah. I mean that's I that's half the I think half the battle. We we try and bounce all those ideas off each other as much as possible and um take in as many kind of opinions as we can on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And I'm wondering about getting to you know, the you, you mentioned the buying the big commercial dehydrator and then eventually finding a manufacturing partner. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what that looked like to like get to, you know, the product we we see today. You know, how long did it take? How many different iterations did you have to try with different ingredients or recipes? Was it testing at home? Was it testing with the manufacturer? You know, what is it, what did it take to to get the beautiful little package that we have today as, you know, what did that really look like day to day to make that happen? Sure. Gosh, I tasted hundreds of miso soups. <laughs> well, I guess in my heart, I knew that I wanted to use Japanese ingredients and make it a genuinely Japanese product. I grew up in Australia. So uh, I was born in Japan, but my family and I, uh, we all moved to Australia when I was 10 months old. So essentially I grew up in as, as an Aussie, but my parents were really traditionally Japanese and they only ate Japanese food day and night to the point where even if we traveled overseas, we'd find ourselves in a Japanese restaurant. So I really grew up understanding Japanese cuisine and also understanding what you know, non-Japanese people enjoyed from Japanese flavors. So, but then, yeah, I wanted to use modern ingredients and it was just about trial and error, to be honest. Um, miso itself is a really versatile ingredient, which um, can really change depending on the ratio of the beans and how long you ferment it, uh, how much koji is in there. And I started use, uh, experimenting with a variety of misos and just combining them with different types of ingredients and toppings. And yeah, it was just a lot of experimentation. And uh, out of all the manufacturers that I could actually choose out of, some of them were canned soups, some of them could produce powders. But freeze drying technology, especially in Japan, is, is one of a kind. And you can just freeze dry anything uh, using their technology. It would just rehydrate to almost 98% of its original consistency, flavor, color, and texture. And I just found that so magical. So <laughs> that's why I chose this company who can actually do the freeze drying process. And it took about one and a half years for all of our creations to finally become the first three flavors that we released. Mm -hmm. And originally it was, the packaging was all in Japanese. 
So, and I guess I created the product with the intention of selling it in Japan. So it never crossed my mind to be ex- exporting this anywhere at all. But funnily enough, like plant-based eating isn't really big in Japan, even still. Um, and I didn't really get much traction in Japan. I did a couple of trade shows and a lot of people just laughed at me saying, you know, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> like, wh- why are you creating a plant-based product? What is the point of this? And I noticed that I had like 90% of my website traffic was coming from the US. So I just had this aha moment like, oh my God, I need to capture this audience. Like this is such a natural market for me. So the following year, we um, decided to exhibit at Expo West. And mind you, it was a shared booth between 20 other Japanese exhibitors. So we literally had this tiny podium space, which was about three feet wide. But um, we had an enormous response from all the people who came by our booth. It was just so incredible and eye-opening where I was like, oh, wow, I'm actually onto something. Like people actually want this product. But the problem was everything was in Japanese. I had no idea how much it was going to cost to bring it into the US. And all these people were coming up to us. Okay, I'm a distributor. I'm a broker. I'm a retailer. What's your wholesale price? What's your MOQ? Like, And I had no answers for all these people. They're like, are you of Kehi? Are you of UNFI? And like all these words just sounded like another language. And all I could say was like, well, I have my soups in Japan. Like, can you come and pick it up from my warehouse there and <laughs> into my Japanese bank account. And they're like, no. <laughs> so from there, we kind of had to go back to square one where it's like, okay, I need to get an exporting license, which is my Japanese company now. And then start a company in the US and then find a warehouse in the US. Is it the West Coast or the East Coast? And find staffing on the ground and, and then repackage everything into FDA compliant packaging as well. So like so many hurdles. And all I knew was that I'd made a really tasty soup, but I had zero experience on marketing or, you know, selling the product in the US. So. Well, thankfully, right. wow. we did have a lot of people along the way that helped us out. Like even if we go back to how did we get, you know, that first year and a half of soups, it was obviously Tsubi basically cold calling companies, getting the manufacturer, and then literally a manufacturer walking us through the process of what do we need? We need foil and you need to create the prints for this. So, and how do you do that? And you're just taking as many baby steps along the way as you can without trying to make mistakes. And thankfully the manufacturer has been amazing and they've been very patient with us in turn trying to, you know, order minimum sizes and understanding that we are a startup, especially years ago when we just didn't know what was going on. And then obviously that shift that Subi's talking about from total Japanese packaging to, okay, how do you actually get your product to the US? It's surprisingly very, very difficult. And even the people that were you know, uh, at, the, at the same trade show with us, which was Expo West, they really didn't know how to do it. It's kind of, it was, it's kind of surprising. Even her manufacturer that she uses, it's quite a large company. They sometimes ask her, can you export our product for us? We're not really sure how to get it. So it's been a lot of, I, I'd say, <laughs> sweat, tears, baby steps, hopefully not too many mistakes along the way to try and get it to the US. Wow, that's super fascinating. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, how did you learn how to figure all of this out? And it sounds like you found people that that maybe, you know, had some ideas and then also just trial and error and tried to to do your best to to figure it out. But that's it's incredible. You're having a product manufactured over in Japan and then you're you're having US compliant packaging, bringing it to the US and then you've got a you're distributing it, you know, here. And wow, that's, that's just a lot of, a lot of logistics to figure out. Oh, definitely. And just not understanding my costs initially and how much exporting really is because the product is really light. I was air shipping a lot of the freight directly to customers, which wasn't that expensive. But then when it came to sending it in a 40 foot container, the kind of money that you have to actually invest in that and the bills that you receive, you know, a month later, pretty, I don't know, scary. (laughs) It, Especially just, when you're starting a, the yeah, business. It's just yeah. a long line of bills that you're like, ah, it's just this price to export it. No, there's an export cost. Somebody yeah. has to put it on the ship. There's shipping to the actual, you have to truck it to the shipper. And then someone has to receive the import. And then someone has to truck it from there to there. I know it sounds it sounds so simple now, but even now it's like, it's like 10 steps. And every one of those costs just add up and you just learn to be better, basically, every time there's a problem out oh, there. Oh, for sure. Like it was really inefficient initially. I was making it from the manufacturer and then I was sending it to another storage on a truck. And then from that storage, I was taking it to another co-packer. And then from the co-packer, 
backpacker, I was sending it to the freight port. And from the freight port, it was going somewhere else. And there were so many areas where I could cut my costs. And then I didn't really realize, you know, until it finally got to my warehouse in the US that I had so many wasted air, like levels of layers of, of costs adding on to it. And uh, yes, yeah, I think over the years, it's just been about making it more efficient and just smoothing out the logistics and the operations side. So definitely life lessons every day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. How long from when you were at Expo West and people were like, we love this, this is great. How long did it take you to then be exporting to the US? Oh, it probably took about maybe a year and a half after that just to yeah. redo everything and hire people who could go over the FDA compliance. Understanding mm -hmm. insurance. That yeah, need. understanding insurance, obviously opening a bank account in the U.S. because I'm not a, a U.S. national. But then... As soon as I was ready, I had a baby. And then a year and a half after that, I had another baby. So the company was kind of on autopilot for a while, to be honest. But now mm -hmm. my kids are, are a bit older and they're sleeping through the night, thankfully. And I've got my sanity back and my sleep back. I've, <laughs> I've really been ready to focus on, on the business. But then COVID hit. So, you know, it's definitely been a bumpy ride. But uh, yeah, it's but, been yeah, I mean, I'm um, yes. The funny thing is like whenever I talk to Tibi, she'll often tell me what happened, but not what the problem was initially. And I'm like, sometimes I hear what the problems are and it makes me sweat a little bit because I'm like, wow, that sounds like a very large problem. But she's able to handle these things like so calmly. It's it, it's actually mind boggling. I don't know if that's from having a child or from working in stressful environments, but it's she's just very, very calm and logical in terms of how she solves a lot of these things. And oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I mean, just just as I think about as someone that works in operations, I think about all the logistics here and the pieces. And I'm just like, wow, like that's just what an incredible mountain to to summit just one little step at a time. So I'm I'm very impressed. It's so fascinating. I mean, honestly, I, I really wish I had access to the startup. Uh, CPG community like five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. I can still, I still ask silly questions on there and people would really go out of their way to help me, give me advice, tell me all their problems and, their, and what was succeeded for them. And yeah. And even offering to become my mentor at some points. And it's been such a wonderful community to be a part of. So thank you for doing that too. Yeah. I'm so glad you're in the community. And I was going to, I was going to bring up, you've been in the community for actually quite a while, you know, comparatively to the community not being super old, you know, even the fact that we talked last year and you were one of the early startup CPG virtual pitch participants. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about like how you found that, what it was like to be part of the pitch. When was that? So I think that was uh, about a year and a half ago. One of our friends was like, hey, you guys should be on Shark Tank or, you know, Dragon's Den. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And we started looking up, uh, Googling, you know, uh, pitch contests. And my manager, Ellie, she found you guys through a newsletter. And we're like, oh, well, let's, you know, apply and see what happens. And we got through and we're like, oh, my God, <laughs> we got through. And I was just like, oh, man, this is the first time I'm going to pitch my product in front of a live audience. And I was so nervous. And I remember back then, like, that. I had a four-month-old and a two-year-old who wasn't sleeping. So I really was just super fatigued. And I found out my pitch was happening at three in the morning, Tokyo time. And I remember just getting out of bed, like bleary-eyed at 2 a.m. and just having to do like 20 jumping jacks and 10 burpees just to get the blood flowing. And I got on screen. I, if I remember correctly, it was like a, just a two-minute pitch in front of a Zoom audience. And you know, thankfully it wasn't on stage. <laughs> and yeah, it was such a blur, but it was like, I was so pumped after that. And it was a really fun experience. Unfortunately, we didn't win the uh, the pitch program, but we did win most likely to purchase award. So that's something that I'm pretty proud of. And yeah, and yeah. Then it opened up the Slack community. So yeah, that was really awesome. Yeah, that's so cool. And as you, so once you had, you were exporting to the US and then you mentioned before we started recording that your first retail store was actually here in Portland, Oregon, which is which is was very exciting. But did you, you know, did you start focusing on retail? Did you 
you know, did you immediately get up a e-commerce website? What did it look like to kind of really start be like, okay, we're getting the product to the US. Now we got to get it to retailers and online. Where did you start marketing and trying to get the product? Right. I mean, our spare room was literally floor to ceiling full of soups. <laughs> so I didn't have a warehouse either <laughs> at the beginning. And I was picking and packing my own soups into either retail form or for customers. You know, I had cuts all over my fingers from <laughs> from handling the, the cardboard, etc. And uh, I think we just reached out to all the biggest uh, natural specialty stores. We had visited Portland once and you know, I really like the vibe and I saw that you guys had a lot of plant-based foods in the restaurants, like you mentioned, and there was a specialty store there called Food Fight. And yeah, I think it was just about emailing each and every one of them one by one saying, hi, I'm Subi, this is my product, you know, would you like to carry it? And initially it was mostly on consignment because, you know, they had no idea who I was and whether the product would be popular with the customers. And and then once we started to grow the business, they, you know, it started to become not on consignment. But in the end, I think we really wanted to focus more on the online side just because it was such a scalable market and it required, I guess, less operational work as in like invoicing and, you know, sometimes having to chase payments. And then some stores, they have specific requirements where they need mm-hmm. a printed invoice in a certain format. And it was just quite operationally heavy. So I really focused uh, on the e-commerce side, which was uh, Amazon and uh, my Shopify store, which is also fulfilled by Amazon and just injecting as much um, advertising, marketing spend on there and trying to grow through there. Actually, so- I'd love to just say hi to Food Fight if they're if they happen to be listening yep. to us, thank you for thank you for being believing in us. <laughs> first purchase, I remember giving to me a high five when when they said they wanted to carry it, and I also remember the funny you you get all these funny stories thinking back years like how much you didn't know. They're like, "What's your minimum order size?" And we're like, 15? And they're like, "We'll take four hundred." We're like, "What? Oh, okay." <laughs> so like, I had no idea. Like, just no idea. Like even a reference point. It was like fifteen, like, like in a really yeah, small like, place. Like, <laughs> and, and one of the guys there, they were just like, "Yeah, we actually just airship it to us. It's light enough where the the, pri- the cost was the same to just airship it as it was to sea ship. So we just would send them by air." So yeah, we I guess we didn't we couldn't really go the traditional route because at the beginning we had no representation in the U.S. So it was really just me on an email. And I think pre-COVID, it was really all about meeting, you know, buyers and distributors and brokers in person and doing demos in the stores. So I just went the more digital route and have still kind of stuck with that. Uh, We're very fortunate to have met uh, some people who have guided us to get into uh, 32 Whole Foods stores on in the Northeast. But outside of that, we're really still focused on e-commerce. Interesting. You also, I think in, because from when I, when you first sent me samples and when I most recently got samples, it looks like there's been a rebrand, which I love the new, the new packaging and everything. It looks beautiful. I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about deciding to kind of update the branding and what that process was like. Oh, thank you. So we relaunched our branding this year. Oh, I really loved our original branding actually. It was super cute, but I think nowadays just brands have such a stronger brand identity and the colors are just popping, you know, especially startup products. They're so colorful and playful. And I really wanted to capture like a wider audience, Gen Z's, millennials, and make it just a fun soup that anyone would want to pick up and, and eat and, you know, kind of surprise them with how high quality the ingredients are. And yeah, so that's how the branding was launched this year. And we're really excited. Yeah. Did you did you work with like an agency on that? And was it was it difficult at all to get all the, you know, packaging? switched out and you know has that been a process that has been ongoing so i was really lucky uh because a designer graphic designer just emailed me out of the blue saying that one of her girlfriends gave her a packet of soup and she really loved the soup so much and she saw the packaging and she just thought that we needed a rebrand and she wanted to help us out so she just messaged saying hey I'm a graphic designer for uh, CPG products and I really want to help you guys out and she sent me a few mock-ups of the potential like rebrands that we could look into and it all just kind of started from there like I wasn't actually looking for a re- anyone to rebrand anything but then when I saw her designs it was like really obvious we needed to change the look and uh that's how it started. And she actually 
uh, rebranded everything almost a year and a half ago, but I just had so much inventory in Japan still for the packaging. So I couldn't actually move on with, you know, unless I threw it all out and that would be a very costly thing. So finally we went through all the packaging because we'd ordered, you know, three years worth of, of film and boxes and yeah. And we re- uh, launched the new design this year. Yeah, that's awesome. It looks incredible. I, I liked the, the design before as well, but I think like you said, like just having it be able to like really pop on retail shelves and everything, the, the new packaging is, is, is really great. It's really clear what's inside. Like my favorite of the soups is probably the spicy miso with mushrooms in the front of that. It's just, it's so, it looks so fun. I I love it. Um, I love all of them, but yeah, it just turned out so great. Oh, I appreciate it. Music to my ears. (laughs) So what's next for Soupy Soup? You know, what are your plans over the next year? Are you still focusing on e-commerce or retailers or both? You know, what what are you thinking about as you go into the coming months and in year? So we're releasing a fifth flavor, which is not miso soup. It's inspired by a trip that we made to New Orleans. And I was just blown away by the spices that they use and just the flavors and the depth of their cuisine. So I wouldn't say it's a Cajun soup, but it's a spicy gumbo soup, gumbo inspired Mm. soup. It will still be plant-based and gluten-free and everything uh, and clean ingredients from Japan. And because of the spices, I was like, oh, I really want to get into the spice market as well. So at the end of the year, we're planning to launch a Japanese spice line as well, which complements all of our soups. So yeah, that's what's new on the horizon for our flavors. And Alex? I guess from um, a focus point of view, we are going to be looking, I think the last 12 months has been about, I guess, clearing up the operational side. It's been very, very difficult from a supply chain perspective to, to really manage inventory and timelines. Um, so it's, I, I think to be spent the last year, literally just clearing this up and things like now she's got her own warehouse on the West coast. And so she's not, you know, taking up someone else's space. Um, she's brought in more people. So she's got great staff right now. And, uh, we were trying to, and we, and, uh, over the last year, sales have been great. Growth has been great. COVID actually been, uh, for Subi specifically, has been very good for growth. Um, people have been at home. People have been looking for easy solutions, um, healthy solutions. And so we've seen, we've grown over the last year. And like March was our best month ever in terms of sales. Uh, we're going to continue to focus on putting money into growing that side of the business. And now that we have basically, I think a lot of the operational side cleared up and great people in place, uh, we're going to be accelerating the investment as well too. So we're looking to invest more. Uh, on the ad side of things. And we are also looking for an outside investor as well, too. Somebody that is strategic who can hopefully mentor us and guide us the way on a few different things. If there's someone out there like that, we are interested in uh, expanding into the retail side of things as well, too. My feel is that that is going to take outside investment. Uh, The online side, I think we could continue to grow just in-house if we wanted to. Um, that's been great. So we're we are looking for uh, someone else out there that wants to and believes in the product. Yeah, and we've been very very lucky up to now to have a lot of people that have helped us, like this designer or even how we got into Whole Foods. We've been just been very very lucky, and people just kind of pop up at the right time, and it's been fateful that that we've been able to do it that way. And I, I, I'm assuming, hopefully, with this podcast or through some other connection, <laughs> someone else will come through, and hey, we have the solution for you, and <laughs> we'll put in the work, and we'll work together as a great team. So that's what we're looking for right now, the next uh, 12 months or so. Yeah, that's great. And do you work with? Um, do you do all the e-commerce marketing and everything? Is that between the two of you, or do you have some outside? help with that? I'm curious kind of who else is is on the team, whether they're official em- employees or, or you know, contractors, like you mentioned the, the designer, but I'm curious who else is behind the scenes. Uh, right now, I work with a handful of freelancers who do a lot of the design work. Um, my manager, Ellie, she's been amazing. Uh, she also reached out to me out of the blue saying, hey, I want to work with you. And that's how we started. She's been with me for a few years now. Uh, she handles a lot of the social media and you know, flyers, etc. And uh, I just hired a logistics manager this year. Uh, his name's Aaron. He's been handling all the warehousing, anything that's involved with the logistics and also uh, the Amazon accounts. 
So yeah, he's been incredible. And right now everything's in house. And yeah, I'm happy to expand with uh, other partners who are specialists in the area as we grow. But right now we actually quite enjoy monitoring what is actually effective and just keeping that human touch there to make sure that, you know, our spend is, is being spent efficiently and correctly. So yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's great. It's so cool. And you've been able to be so effective with your e-commerce, which is amazing and just super awesome to see the and to hear the teams growing. Now, when I was looking at Subi's LinkedIn, I noticed a lot of different ventures as current. I see sake, I see property management, like you just doing all these things. Like, so yeah, if you want to share about that, that would be great. Sure. So another venture that I'm involved in is an alcoholic beverage, sake. It's uh, called Four Fox Sake, as in the number four and the animal fox. Uh, I started this with three friends from Hong Kong. So there's four of us. And it's a premium Jumai Daiginjo sake that's made in Japan. And and it's a beautiful sake. Uh, we received 94 points in Decanter Magazine, which is the authority in the world of alcohol. And uh, the bottle is magnificent. It comes in this super chromed out bottle with uh, two samurai swords engraved on the side. And it has this emblem on the front with Tori gates and four foxes. And it has an LED light that lights up the bottle in this luminous blue. So it's really cool when you pull it out at a bar or a club. And this brand we've been working on for a few years. Uh, we've just recently partnered with one of the major distributors in China. So we're entering into that market. And uh, we in the US, we're stock carried at uh, many high-end venues, such as the W Hotel, Morimoto Restaurants in Las Vegas. And we're in some of the in-flight beverage lists in Qantas Airways. And so, yeah, this one, uh, Four Fox Sake. <laughs> now it's starting to sound like an ad. <laughs> but yeah, Four Fox Sake, it's, it's a very exciting venture that I'm also a part of. Uh, separate from that, I also co-founded a company called Hakuba White Fox. I co-founded this business with Alex. Alex, if you want to touch base on this one. So we live, we actually live in, um, we used to live in Tokyo and we used to live in Hong Kong, but a few years ago, we moved to a ski resort called uh, Hakuba. It started when we just built a home, a ski chalet, basically for our own personal use and for investment. And then other people started looking to invest with us and build more. And we built, basically we built more and more, but we were all doing that from Tokyo. And a couple of years ago, we moved to Hakuba because we were basically not satisfied with the, the level of property management that existed. And we, we started a property management company. Uh, we also started an investment company as well, too, to help outside investment come into the area. Uh, Hakuba is a ski resort. It's located in the Japanese Alps. And, and basically Japan is known for powder skiing. And like, for example, this last year, we received 45 feet of snow. So we get a lot of snow. That's yeah. the average. There are other areas. It's great, great, great skiing. Uh, we live two minutes from the, the, the closest resort. That's kind of been my focus for the last, it's only, it's only three years old now, this company, but uh, we've grown it from just a single chalet. Now we're going to be, we're at 15 chalets under management this year and one boutique hotel. So I spend a lot of my time focused on that area and the investment side as well too, where we have outside investors basically trying to help this area grow. So that's kind of the the Hakuba side of things. And if you guys ever, if anyone ever likes to, to ski or snowboard, come out to Japan. Well, uh, we'll give you some tsubi soup and a great <laughs> ski chalet to stay at. So. <laughs> I love sake. that. <laughs> yeah, I I was looking at the website for the sake and the it's just gorgeous as Subi oh, described. And wow, we 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 enjoy sake at our house. We're skiers and snowboarders, so I'm just like, man, we really oh, need wow. we do need to get some sake and we need to it's come we need to visit y'all in uh, in Japan. <laughs> You should. For sure. It's only it's like two you know two and a half hours outside of Tokyo, so it's people love it. They'll do the Tokyo trip, they'll do the Kyoto trip to see all the historical stuff, and then people will come stay out for a week. Um, we have ten resorts within like ten minutes of drive of us. Oh basically. wow, that's yeah, incredible! World class skiing, world class skiing for sure. Cool, that's great. Yeah, you you all have multiple entrepreneurial ventures going on, and I think that that that's so cool to get to hear about more of them. Yeah. It's very busy. So as far as where people can find you, because hopefully after this, they're going to realize that they need some Subi soup in their life so they can go to 
subisoup.com and they can place yeah. an order. I think they should follow you on Instagram too, which is at subisoup. And yeah. then you mentioned Northeast Whole Foods. Is there anywhere else I'm missing that people can find you? Uh, on Amazon. We're on oh, yeah. There. Amazon. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we've just started our TikTok channel. <laughs> Ooh, this nice. week nothing's on there yet <laughs> but, uh, but it's a first step <laughs> no i'm too well, old actually, to be that's a good doing that's, any sort of dancing yeah that's the sort of thing like uh we we will actually use someone outside who, who uh, like an outside contractor to manage that as subi just does not have time to manage the tiktok channel <laughs> I, I can almost guarantee you that yeah but I could see tick like TikToks of like the the soup just blooming as you add hot water. Like it could that's just like relaxing. Like I I would it's watch those good. videos. Like <laughs> yeah, it's like those slime videos that, that's true. <laughs> that were like slime. cutting the kinetic sand. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, there's something relaxing about it. <laughs> that's yeah, it could be onto something. That's true. <laughs> blooming blooming soups. Blooming soups. Yes, that's what it should be called. <laughs> Okay, so people should follow on on TikTok as well. But we'll include all the links in the show notes for everybody. But, you know, if anybody's looking, it's T-S-U-B-I, and then the word soup for both the website and for for Instagram. And then I'm assuming for TikTok as well. Yep, it's the same. Yeah, to be soup. Okay, great. And, yep. then, and then Amazon, another super convenient way to try. So is there anything else that you wanted to share? So last of all, I just want to thank all my customers because honestly, I would not still be doing this if it wasn't for all the positive feedback, the messages on social media, even the random emails that you send me just, and it, it just really just keeps me going because a lot of times things get really difficult or very uncertain. And, and I question whether I really should be, continue doing this business. And especially when I'm in the low, someone would just always email and say, thank you so much for making this product. You know, please keep doing it. I, I really appreciate it. And that's just for me is, is everything. So I just want to say thank you so much for continuing to believe in our brand and the things that we do. That's wonderful. The really incredible thing about this brand, I think, um, just looking at it from like a separate point of view, which is it has such, I guess, raving fans is the best way of putting it, where, you know, uh, Tsubi showed me the data. Uh, I was looking on Shopify the other day. I was like, oh, I love just going through the data of our of US sales. And, you know, the re purchase rate from that customer base is 55%. So, you know, we actually start to get to know a lot of the names and addresses like, oh, this person's rebuying again. But I, I was blown away. A 55% repurchase rate of from customers is, I, you know, I don't know other brands repurchase rate, but, you know, it just seems very, very high to me. Yes, uh, it really yeah. gives me such faith in the product. I already know it tastes good, but it just shows me that the more hands we get this into, even if that, even if it stayed at 50 or 40%, that's, I think would be just incredible. So that's, that's kind of the number one goal out there is like, get this in as many hands as possible. And I'm very, very confident it will succeed. And the other thing, I guess when I looked at the data, which kind of blown me, blew me away as well too, which was like the average purchase size over the last year, it shifts a bit, but it's between 75 to $85. So, oh wow! Yeah, it's it's like an enormous amount to me to spend on any food product, right? Even if I don't know any food product, I probably don't spend more than fifty dollars on anything at one time, right? And for someone to spend seventy five, eighty, eighty five dollars at a time, or you know, we get orders for like hundred and hundred and thirty dollars of soups. Um, we just want to say thank you. We we really really appreciate that. I mean, it's such an incredible uh, gesture and uh, testament to the product that Subi has made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's so. It's just a great staple to have in your house, too. It's so versatile, great shelf life with the freeze drying technology. So I it, I could see how it makes sense to make some larger purposes because you know you're going to use it. You know it's not going to, you know, it's it's not going to go bad and you can use it in so many different ways. So that's so interesting to hear about the data behind that. Yeah, it's, <laughs> we're always happy. Yeah, ah, two years shelf life. That's great. Mm -hmm. So yeah, or emergency supplies when your four-year-old or one-year-old is hungry at two in the morning and you just... <laughs> <laughs> something that happened last night child screaming for but she's hungry and you just got to feed her something and it was rice with subi soup in it and she gobbled it up and went straight back to sleep perfect awesome i love it 
Well, this has been so awesome, Subi and Alex. I've been looking forward to talking with you for a, you know quite a while. We've had this schedule, so I've been very excited. I'm super excited to continue to follow the journey of Subi Soup. And we're big Thank spice you. users in our household, so the spice blends oh, yeah. sound awesome. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, like I'm very, I'm just very excited, and it was such an honor to get to hear more of the story. And you know, I'm just so glad that you're both a part of the startup CPG community, and that we could you know catch up and get to chat today. So thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having us, Jesse. Thank you very much, Jesse. Thanks for joining us. This Startup CPG podcast is executive produced by me, Jesse Freitag. Theme music is by the Super Fantastics. We'd love to have you join our community of founders and experts. Get the invite at startupcpg.com. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening right now. It's the easiest way to help us grow our community. See you next time.